Hey everybody, it's Glenn Kreitzer, and uh, I'm here again this month to talk to you about uh, swing music. So this month I want to do something special for our dancer friends, but I think even if you're not a dancer, you're going to get a lot out of this video. You'll, you'll still be able to learn something. Um, this month I want to talk about selecting music for choreography uh, when you're going to be performing with, with a live band, and how to most... Um, effectively work with live musicians in, in performing choreography with a live group. Um, now, you know, up until recently, I, most of the choreography that has been done in the Lindy Hop scene for, for competitions and things like that has been with canned music. Uh, you know, generally we do our competitions to live music and we do our, uh, uh, our routines, our choreographed pieces to canned music. But as there are more and more bands out there and more op opportunities for, for dancers to perform with live music, either at events or in, uh, you know, settings at, at parties and things like that. I thought it would be good to do a tutorial for you guys on some of the things that you should be thinking about when you are selecting music to work with the band and then how, how to best work with musicians. Um, okay, so let's start with picking music. Um, so one of the most important things that you need to understand is what parts of a song are improvised and what parts of a song are written out. Now, um, the, the reason for this is it's going to affect your choreography overall. If you are working with a section of music that is written out and is uh, going to be very much the same every time that it's performed, you can hit a lot more of the nuance in, in the uh, in the, the music, in what's happening in the music. Whereas if it's going to be improvised and different every time, you're not going to be able to count on hitting rhythms that are happening in that section uh, uh, of the music because they're going to be different if they're, if they're improvised in a live scenario. So, um, you know, the, the type of ensemble that you're working with is the largest thing that's going to affect that. Um, if you're working with a big band, for example, you're going to have a lot of written out sections, a lot of ensemble sections, what we call those, where everything is written out. It's going to be pretty much the same as it is on the record, with with some certain variations that we'll we'll, we'll get into. Um, the solo sections are often going to be different, unless it's maybe a very like iconic solo. Uh, you know the. Uh, the, the solo in In the Mood, most trumpet players know that solo, you know. Uh, um, so things like that that are very iconic, people people will be able to usually play off the record if they're a good player. Um, the opposite example sort of of a big band would be like a Dixieland ensemble where typically nothing is written out. It's all uh, just typically chorus after chorus after chorus. Maybe they throw in a verse somewhere. Um, and just different people take solos. Somebody plays the head on the way in while other people improvise around them. Uh, everybody takes solos and then they play an out chorus where everybody plays again. Um, so that is not pr particularly repeatable in, in terms of, yes, doing a song over and over again is repeatable, but any of the rhythms, any of the, the nuance, anything that's happening in the arrangement um, is not going to be real repeatable. So if you are choosing music that is less repeatable for your um, for your choreography, then you're going to have to bear that in mind in your choreography and create choreography that is more flexible. Whereas you can create more specific nuanced choreography with more uh, repeatable music. Okay, so that kind of looks at that. And, and, and of course, there's I should say there's, there's all sorts of variations in between. There are some big band charts that are really like there's hardly any solos. Pretty much everything is written out. Um, and then there's, you know, like the typical big band chart that's got some solos in it, but there's a lot of stuff written out. Um, there's more like riff-based big band charts that are a little bit freer. It's a lot more solos, like the early Ellington stuff, the bassy stuff. There's a lot more solos with maybe just a shout riff. Um, then you get into sort of your swing combo stuff. Now, some of that can be very arranged. Uh, some of it can be very loose and free. So it really just depends on the tune. If you're listening to a tune and you're not sure what parts that you're hearing are arranged and what parts that you're hearing that are improvised, um, the best thing to do is probably to talk to a musician. Um, I, one of the places I would start, first of all, is on this Patreon. There's a, um, a discussion in the sort of introduction video, and I talk about musical form there, and, and I think that would be helpful a, a helpful sort of place to start. But um, if that's something that you're not familiar with, I recommend talking to musicians 
and just listening to way more jazz and, and watching way more jazz, you know, taking some time when you are at a, an event where there is a live band to sit there and watch the band for a while or stand up by the stage and watch the musicians and watch what they're doing uh, or to go out and just hear live jazz um, even when it's not a dance, that's okay to do. It's allowed, cats. Um, go hear live music, go watch musicians play, and you'll start to have a better understanding of, of what's improvised and what's written out. Um, okay, so those are the things I think um, that, that affect that. Uh, another thing I, I just want to touch on is um, um, drumming. So drumming there are different ways that different drummers approach things. Some drummers can really play what's off on the record. Um, of course, sometimes it's really difficult to hear the drums on those early records, um, especially on the, the very early stuff, like the 20s stuff, where sometimes it's, it's really buried pretty far back because it had to be so that it wouldn't uh, you know, make the needle skip uh, in, in recording the, uh, the music or, or you know, screw up the equipment in some way, make it peek out, stuff like that. Um, so that's a variation you're going to kind of have to almost count on, that there's, there might be some differences in the drumming. Um, now, if there are really important specific hits in an arrangement or something like that, you can typically count on those being there. But, um, you know, if there's a drum solo, don't count on choreographing to like hits and stuff in the drum solo because that's never going to happen. Um, okay, so touched on drumming, good. And, and better drummers, will, I, I should say, will be able to do more of what's on the, the, uh, the record if they have it in an arrangement. They're better readers, they'll be able to do that. Uh, okay, so let's see, talked about that, talked about improv. All right, uh, another thing that you have to consider is the playability of an arrangement. And there are kind of three different factors in playability here. The first of those is the difficulty of the arrangement, um, how hard it is to play. And um, look, there's a lot of bands out there, and you know, some of them are really good, and some of them are not so good, uh, and some of them are in between. And um, if something is just over the heads of the musicians, you you gotta know. And you don't, because you don't, don't, don't necessarily want to put yourself up there with somebody who's going to just butcher this chart that you're going to play or butcher the tune and not, not be able to handle an arrangement um, of, of something that you are, you put a lot of work into choreographing and, and creating and, and, you know, you don't want it to be disastrous because the band can't handle the chart. So the two sides to that are, first of all, to understand how good the band is that you're hearing legitimately. And uh, band leaders will not always tell you. Um, I will tell you. Like, if I look at a chart and I say, you know what, we can totally play this, but it would take a rehearsal. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this without a rehearsal. It's got these parts that change tempo, or it's got this really difficult saxophone passage, and I don't think it's wise to do it without a rehearsal. I would tell you that honestly. Other people will not. They'll be so we can do anything, and they'll put it on the stand and schlep through it, and, and you know, and it'll be a train wreck. Uh, and you don't want that. So keep in mind the difficulty um, when you're selecting the music, the more difficult a piece of music that you select to play, the fewer bands that are going to be able to do it well. So that's something you have to consider on the front end and then on the, on the back end of once you've selected it, can X band do it, right? Um, the other thing um, you need to consider is the difficulty of things that happen in the solo voices. So, for example, if there are some crazy high trumpet notes uh, and they're really vital, uh, sorry, really vital to the arrangement uh, in a particular spot, even though the arrangements, you know, the, the difficulty of the passage work or anything like that may not be so hard, um, if you just don't have a trumpet player in your band that can hit those notes, forget it. Uh, you know, if you pick something with a Cat Anderson solo in it, there's almost nobody that can play as high as Cat Anderson, unless you're working with Doc Severinsen, you know, on the gig, and by which by all means do it. But obviously, our goal here is to to try and make the to select music that you can do in more than one situation with more than one band. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, particularly high clarinet notes, uh, um, you know, very difficult 
uh, uh, piano things, stuff like that. So not just the difficulty of the ensemble, but the difficulty of, of things happening in individual voices. Uh, and the best way to account for that is, uh, if you're not sure, you know, ask an arranger. Don't ask any musician. Ask an arranger because um, that's who's going to really be able to tell you honestly, like, the level of difficulty and and ask a good arranger there are a lot of schleppy arrangers out there we'll talk about that in a minute um, uh, another thing to consider when selecting music is um, along the lines of the playability is is the song that you're selecting is it really dependent on an individual's voice so for example people ask me all the time hey do you guys play fat swallows your feet's too big and my answer is no because it's a great song, I love that recording, but I'm not going to sing that and sound like Fats Waller, and that tune hangs on the way that he does it. And I've never heard anybody else ever do it where I thought it was, like after hearing it, where I went, oh, that was a good idea that they did that, because it's just not Fats. So when you're picking a tune, you have to consider that like if the performance made the tune, um, then that's not going to be something that's going to be repeatable by, by live musicians. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I think you should consider with this is uh, whether the tune has any unusual instrumentation. So if you pick something that's got, you know, like big band with, I don't know, a jazz cello in it or something, or like a, a, something that has celesta or harpsichord, and that instrument is really vital to the arrangement. Um, you know, sometimes harpsichord can be substituted, piano can sub in, and it won't be exactly the same, but it'll be okay, it'll work. Um, but other things, you know, uh, maybe an accordion solo or something, I mean, it's, you gotta consider that when selecting those things, it's gonna limit the number of bands that are gonna be able to play it just based on instrumentation. Now, sometimes something can have a weird instrument but it's not vital to the arrangement. Uh, you know, maybe it's just the, an accordion solo in the middle and you could put a sax solo in there instead. That's totally fine. But, um, you know, if you're playing something that it's, where it's really vital, it's, it's going to be, it's going to really limit your ability to do it. Okay, so that's kind of like the picking music side of this. Um, let's take a look some at just how to like achieve this with bands, with, with musicians who are out there. Um, so the first question you have to find out is, does the band that is you, you want to work with, that you want to perform this with, actually have enough musicians to cover all of the parts? Um, you know, all the time people, you know, I, I'll, I'll be somewhere with a quartet and people will say, can you guys play In the Mood? And no, because we have a guitar, a piano, a bass, and a singer, so we can't play In the Mood. You know, and then, I mean, I'm, I'm nice about it, but it's, but it's, you know, once you've heard that for the hundredth time, you sort of go, ah, no, we can't. So you've got to know what the instrumentation is on the original record. Uh, a great way to find that out is to look in a discography. Uh, if you buy all of your music on iTunes, you're probably screwed because you don't own any discographies. Uh, there is the Rust discography out there. If you can track a copy of that down, it's got a lot of stuff. There's also the Lord discography. Uh, there's also a great discography online for Ellington stuff uh, called, I think it's like Ellen, Ellingtonia.com. Um, I think there's one out there for Fletcher Henderson stuff. Um, probably there's something out there for Basie. Uh, Glenn Miller stuff is really hard to track down. Some of it's harder than others. Uh, it just depends. Uh, sometimes you can get a book that's got the discography of everything in the back, like a bio of the band leader or something like that. So those are really good ways to track down that information. But CD liner notes are a really, really awesome way to do that, or uh, you know, album notes. Um, we started posting all of ours online, so everybody has access to them, whether they bought it on iTunes or whether they bought it, you know, physical copy. But um, but in general, you only get that information if you bought a physical copy. So something to keep in mind. Um, so number of musicians is it sufficient to play the the piece um the next thing you've got to really ask yourself the honest question of is does this band that i want to work with actually play the style of music that is on this recording because um you know if you get a band and they're like a dixieland band and you're like yeah i want to do this 
piece to this California Ramblers things from thing from the twenties, they're not going to be able to execute that, um, you know. And uh, if if you get the best nineteen twenties California Ramblers style band in the world, and you're like, yeah, I want to do this thing from like. You know, I, w- I want to do this choreography to jam in the blues. They're, they're not going to be able to accomplish... They're not even going to have the right instruments to accomplish that, let alone want to or, you know, it's, it's a fish-out-of-the-water kind of scenario. So make sure the band that you are working with does whatever it is that your piece is, right? Um, and so, you know, that is a thing to consider. Like, the more obscure thing that you pick, the harder it may be to, to do that. Um, in general, if obviously if you're working with a, a big band and you have a small band arrangement, usually they've got the musicians and the configuration can be made to do whatever small band thing that you're, you're doing. Um, and generally big bands can play big band stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that more in, in a minute. Um, uh, the third thing is just touching again on the playability issue. Uh, you know, how, do we have the right instruments, the right instrumentation, all of that to to play it, can the musicians in the band execute what's in the chart? That's really important. You got to really know that. And then, um, then the next question you've got to ask yourself here, and this kind of goes back to our original topic of like how improvised versus how written out is this: is does uh, your thing need a written out arrangement? Um, and so, if it's a very free form thing on the recording, where it's like maybe there's a four bar piano intro, and then you know, somebody plays the head while everybody else improvises, or everybody plays the head in unison, uh, and you know, and then somebody takes the bridge, and then it's four choruses and out, or whatever. Maybe you don't need an arrangement for that. Um, so if that's the case, um, there are still things that you need to communicate to the band leader. Um, the first is, what is the form? You have to know what the form of the tune is. You have to be able to say, okay, there's a four-bar piano introduction, and then there's going to be uh, an ensemble chorus where the trumpet takes the melody, and then a clarinet solo, and then you know for a whole chorus, and then a half a chorus of trombone, and a half a chorus of piano, and then everybody plays again on the way out. Um, you need to be able to communicate that. And of course, you also the, the what goes along with that is that you want to be able to give the band leader a copy of the recording, but don't expect the band leader to do the work for you on this. Hand them a piece of paper like or send them an email that says here's what the form of this is there's a four bar interlude after the second chorus that uh, modulates to a flat or whatever and if you don't know that stuff then get a musician to help you with it because it's important and it's going to make you look more professional if you can show up and hand the band leader a thing or preferably email in advance because it's much better if we have the opportunity to prepare things um and send them a, a sheet that says here's what the form of our tune is and uh, we you know um, the instrumentation in this spot is really important it's really got to be a trombone solo here but the other stuff is more loose etc um, uh, another thing that you need to communicate is spe- specificity of style so if you like I said before if you really need 19 uh, late, late 20s, you know, like a, a, that that feel to the music, you've got to really be able to communicate that to the band. And you go, we really need this groove. That's what makes this piece work. Um, you have to know what that groove is, right? You have to under- understand it. And, you know, you just don't just rely on sending them a recording and go, you know, I'm kind of like this. Because if they know that you don't know the difference, then they won't care. In most cases, I always care. I probably care more than you do, which is fine. But most band leaders probably aren't going to care because they're going to go, "Well, if you don't know the difference, then why should I? Why should I put any effort into it?" Right? So you really need to be able to communicate that, like what you want out of that that groove, you know. Um, and that's really important, um, you know. Specifically, like with that early stuff, like if the, if the drummer is, you know, if you can't hear the drums on the record. You better tell them, hey, we don't want a drummer playing on the ride cymbal. This is, we don't want a Dixieland thing. We want them doing a choke cymbal thing or, a, or at least a snare drum thing, you know, press rolls or something. Um, another thing that's really important is to um, let them know about key changes. Uh, specifically when there's like a, um, 
you know, a modulation that happens where there's like a, um, a break that sets up the modulation or um, a, um, like a modulation at the end of the tune, like the last chorus goes up a half step. That can be really important in the energy of the tune when the last chorus goes up a half step and your choreography is probably going to fit that raised energy. You may not get that from the band if, um, if they don't do that half step change, if you just say, ah, you know, four choruses. Um, another thing to communicate is dynamics. Um, theoretically, like, let's say there's a recording and it's four choruses long. In the first chorus, everybody plays loud, and then the second chorus is really quiet. And it's just a, a quiet clarinet solo. And then the third chorus is, gets bigger again, whatever. Well, if you choreograph, if you create choreography that is like mellow and quiet and laid back, and they don't know to do that, um, your choreography is not necessarily going to fit what they play. So, uh, what you want to do is basically draw out a sheet with the form and say, first chorus this, second chorus half this, half this, quiet third chorus, boisterous, you know, stuff like that. Um, and the last thing you want to do is actually provide a lead sheet. Um, and you might have to do some hunting to get it and make sure you get a good one with good, correct changes. Talk to a musician. You may have to pay somebody to transcribe it. It won't be much for a lead sheet, but that's okay because then when you can, again, this is all, you're, you're being much more professional you're not expecting the band leader to do the work of figuring out the music for your routine, which really they shouldn't be doing. You should make this as easy for them as possible. So you hand them a lead sheet and, and a sheet that shows like what the form you want is on it and you know any, any important features. You're going to look really professional. You're going to get a way better performance out of the band. Um, so hi highly recommend it. Um, okay, now the other side of this is arranged music. If the music is more complex, if there are arranged parts in the music, if it's a big band chart, if it's a small band chart, even if it's a small band chart that's not, um, doesn't have complex ensemble sections, but maybe has like a lot of breaks or a lot of changes to the form, you're going to need an arrangement. And um, if you're doing something that's really ubiquitous, like in the mood or sing, 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 you can generally expect that most band leaders are going to have those arrangements. If you were doing anything that is not totally ubiquitous, and I don't just, I don't mean in the swing world. Like in the swing world, there are songs that we all know and love, but the rest of the world doesn't give a shit about them. So you got to have your own arrangement, and do not expect band leaders to spend time transcribing stuff for you unless they really love you. Um, the old timers showed up with their own arrangements everywhere they went. They were going to do routines, they show up at the theater, they don't know who the orchestra is, they show up, they have their own arrangement, it gets passed out, it gets collected up by them at the end. That's just what you did in the old days. You hired somebody, generally to write a new original arrangement that you then, you know, rehearsed um, using like a piano reduction, you'd rehearse it with a pianist who could play a reduction of it so you could create your choreography to it, um, and then um, you'd you know, you would perform it live with an orchestra, maybe get a couple rehearsals with the orchestra as well, so you can hear the whole thing. But um, now, whether you're, which, by the way, if you want to do that, you should totally do that, because we need more stuff to original music and, and collaborations and creations. Uh, we did a really cool piece like that, um, myself and the Syncopated City Dancers, where they created a, a routine called the Lennox, uh, to a song I wrote called The Lennox, but we talked about kind of what we wanted the, the tune to be and the, and the, the choreography to be, to be in advance. And so what we ended up with was a routine that the first chorus of it is the first chorus. The second chorus is a shout chorus, and then I wrote the first and second choruses so that the third chorus could add, or the, sorry, the fourth, there's a, there's a third chorus that's just uh, kind of jamming, and then the fourth chorus of it um, has the musical parts of both the first and the second choruses and they interlock with each other. So I had to write both of those thinking about them in such a way that they would interlock with each other when they were played together. And that way the choreography can do the same. You can have both the first and second, choreo second chorus choreographies happening simultaneously. So new choreographies are very, very cool and you should consider doing that. But if you are working with transcriptions, hire a transcriber. Hire a good transcriber. There are so, 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 so many really, really, really crappy people doing transcriptions. 
I can't tell you how many really bad transcriptions I've seen out there. Don't rely on store-bought stuff. Don't rely on stuff that somebody goes, oh, I got that one. Because, the, for example, there's a Fletcher Henderson uh, chart out there for wrapping it up. Um, and it says very clearly, it's definitely the Fletcher Henderson chart. It's right off the Fletcher Henderson record. It's not. It's right off the Benny Goodman record, which is missing 16 bars as compared to the Fletcher Henderson chart. Hmm. Yikes. So, hire somebody to do the work. Don't rely on the off the shelf and don't don't hire a crappy arranger. Hire somebody who's really high caliber because honestly, like the difference in price between somebody who's really good and somebody who's really crappy is not that much, but boy is the difference in the quality huge. Um, so hire somebody that you can communicate with about that and show up with your own arrangements. Um, another thing that a good arranger can do is they can tell you if a big band arrangement that you want to do can also be reduced for a smaller band. Um, and typically what I would ask for, by the way, with big band arrangements is um, I would ask for five saxes and three trumpets and three trombones and a full rhythm section, four piece rhythm section. And I would request that if possible that the arrangement have the third trombone and the fifth sax be optional. Because a lot of bands out there uh, only carry two trombones, like Jonathan Stout's band only carries two trombones, uh, typically. Um, a lot of bands out there only carry four saxes. So that's a really, like, if you have that arrangement, even if it's a little bit bigger band, you're going to be cool. And, uh, um, I mean, on the, on the record. And if you walk into a situation where you're working with a big band that has four trumpets and four trombones, two guys can just sit there. It's totally fine. Um, it's That's not a big deal. Somebody gets the rest of their chops for a tune. No issue there. Um, also, an arranger can tell you if the arrangement can be reduced for smaller ensembles. So other good sizes of ensemble to have are a 10-piece big band. There are a lot of 10-piece big bands out there, as well as uh, if, it's, you know, if it's reducible for 10, and a good arranger can tell you that. And a 7-piece band, um, uh, usually trumpet, trombone, uh, a sax or a clarinet, and a rhythm section, or trumpet and two saxes in the rhythm section, either way. Uh, an arranger will be able to tell you if, if that can be done. Uh, they will charge you extra to do that, but not as much as probably, you know, writing a whole new transcription or something like that. So um, if you have a couple different ones in the bag that you can show up and go, oh, there's going to be a seven-piece band at, th at this, we'll perform with that. You've got that seven-piece chart boom, you're there. You're going to do it with a big band over here, boom, you get the big band chart. So it gives you more options. If, if the arrangement you pick happens to be reducible, it's worth spending a little extra money to get the couple of other uh, versions of it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that kind of that kind of wraps it up, uh, kind of sums it up. So hire good arrangers, work with good bands, get out there and make stuff with live musicians, you guys. Make new stuff. Make new choreography. Um, I mean, come on. We're all sick of hearing canned music. I, I love all these old recordings, but I want to listen to them at home. I don't want to go out and see somebody doing choreography to them. Let's, let's make some new stuff here as, as, uh, as bands and musicians and, and dancers, like as artists. Let's, let's create. Um, and, uh, and I see more people doing that, and it really excites me. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of really great dancers creating interesting stuff and uh, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun so uh, I hope that gives you guys a sort of basic primer on how to start thinking about choreographing with live music and I will see you guys uh, next month alright thanks for subscribing and uh, I'll see you soon bye